you have your Bibles, turn with us to Revelation chapter 14. We are walking through Revelation verse by verse and line by line, and hopefully you have learned something in this series. And if you haven't learned anything, let me give you the gist of Revelation. You better get ready. You better get ready because he is coming. And you just watch uh, the, any, everything from the world news to uh, just a lot of things going on, folks. It is a preview of things to come. And we as Christians not only need to be ready, we need to tell others that he's coming. And that's very, very important. Today I want to talk to you about the final reaping. The final reaping. And you remember we're in this pause uh, before we get right back to uh, the second half of the tri tribulation period. He is introducing what is going to happen in chapter 16, 17, and 19. Uh, so you can see what's going to happen here, and he uses this as an introduction to get you ready for that. Today we only have two points. Uh, so if you think we're getting out early, you better think again. <laughs> Annette said something. Only two points? I said, listen, we have to go by the text, not by points. All right, there's two points here. Number one, if you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, the grain harvest. The grain harvest. And to understand this, you need to understand the grain harvest symbolizes the seven bowl judgment. The seven bowl judgment, which we will speak of here in just a few minutes. Number two, the grape harvest. The grape harvest. And that is speaking of the Battle of Armageddon. Folks, I am telling you, it will be the battles of all battles. And when I say that, I am talking about numbers of people. But I will give you a preview of that. Jesus Christ, I am telling you, he is going to wipe out every one of his enemies. And uh, we will speak of that also. God's final judgment on earth is the central focus of the second half of, the, of Revelation chapter 14. After years of enduring the Antichrist persecution, the day of the Lord will fall on Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, and all the demonic angels here on earth. It will be the full fury of the Lord Jesus Christ and his judgment. It will reveal the seven bold judgments and the battle of Armageddon. Jesus used the familiar story of the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13 earlier in his ministry to explain to his disciples what will happen in the end day. Let's look at this serious and sombering scripture in the second half of Revelation chapter 14. Number one, the grain harvest. Chapter 14, verse 14. Then I looked. I looked. John uh, says this several times in the book of Revelation. And behold, a, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And here you can see uh, uh, you know, several uh, descriptions of Jesus Christ. At first, he's coming on a white cloud. And clouds, uh, you know, we associate them with angels, all right? But also, uh, we associate them, when you, when you look in the sky and you see clouds, you know, I don't know if you've ever done that, you looked at certain symbolism of that. Well, folks, the Bible here says Jesus is coming on a white cloud. And the second thing, and one who was like the Son of Man, having his head uh, a golden crown. And there's several kinds of crown, but the golden crown is for the victor. Okay, the diadem is for kings, but this, when Jesus comes, Jesus comes back at the last part of the tribulation, folks, he is coming as a victor. He will win, all right? There's no power stronger than Jesus. And it said, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And, uh, you know, if you go back in history, Okay, now they have combines, they have all these things, modern technology, all that is going on there. Uh, but in the old days, the sickle, it had like what we would say a broomstick, and it had a sharp edge 
uh, in the sickle look almost like a quarter moon there. And that is how, especially in the days of old, uh, Jesus' days, and in, in, in these first centuries, all these, uh, that's how they got the grain in. And you would use that sickle to cut as close to the ground as you can to gather that grain. And as you know, folks, it, 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 was, uh, it was sharp, okay? It, it just, when you think of it, you could really hurt yourself uh, if somebody is playing with it or a kid because it was so razor sharp to cut that grain. So we see the picture of this, Jesus uh, having a crown, a golden crown and a sharp sickle. And it says, and another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the crowd. Last time we looked at Revelation, uh, we saw there were three angels in the early part of chapter 14. So this is the fourth angel, and he comes out of the temple, okay? And we know the temple of God is where the presence of what God was in the Old Testament, but the presence of God is in heaven. And folks, you, I, I just can't imagine, uh, I was talking to somebody this week, about what it's going to be like when the rapture of the church happens and we go up and, you know, like our first two minutes in heaven. Folks, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I think my mouth is going to drop, all right? I think I'm going to look around and, and it is going to be amazing uh, to be in a perfect place, a perfect environment, no sin, no sorrow, no pain, no disease. All right, just love, just God and love and Jesus Christ and, and his presence. And, he, and it says, of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. And of course, that was the angel speaking to Jesus. And he, we remember that angels are messengers of God. Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap and the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he's using this picture of a farmer, okay? And folks, uh, the harvest, you have a certain amount of time to harvest, uh, you know, the grain or harvest fruit or whatever you are harvesting. You can't do it too early or it will not be ripe. You can't do it too late or it'll be too ripe. So here's the deal, folks. God knows the time of the harvest. God already knows the day. He knows the day. And I am telling you, when that last person is saved, God knows who that person is. He will look over to Jesus at the right hand of God, and he will say, go get my bride. And I'm telling you, for the Christian, it'll be the best day of your life. But for the unbeliever, I am telling you, I would hope it would be an awakening to those who do not believe. You have to understand what chaos that is going to be when the Christians leave this world. And think about it now. Folks, it's an evil world now. And you take all the Christians out of it, and it'll be even worse. It'll be total chaos. So he is, the angel, I believe, has come from heaven, from the presence of God, and God is saying, now is the time. So he who sat on the cloud thrust his sickle on earth, and the earth was, re was reaped. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament, and I love going back and forth uh, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, because it just tells you how accurate the Bible is. The best commentary on the New Testament is the Old Testament. The best top, top commentary on the Old Testament is the New Testament. Those, those words that you see in the New Testament, they are quoted all through the Old Testament. So hold your finger there and look at Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. And look at verse 28. And folks, 
God's Spirit has been poured out on mankind in several places. The first century was when the Holy Ghost came down in Acts chapter 2. In that Holy Spirit, it's that dunamis that, that gave the power to that New Testament church. I'm telling you, Peter stood up and preached, and 3,000 souls got saved. And there was an indication that there were, normally they counted just the men. It was probably much more than that. What can that be? It is the Holy Spirit. It is the power of God through the Holy Spirit. And even during the tribulation times, we talked about the 144,000 evangelists. They are sealed. Last week we talked about how they, the, the angel preached the gospel. And I'm telling you, people are going to be saved. There is, there's going to be salvation even in those last days and in these terrible times because God is, is patient. God, God is waiting. God is giving people second and third chances. So we look at verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Also on my man, men servants and on my maid servants, and I will pour out my spirit in those days. Folks, God is not through yet. If he was through saving people, he would have already come. But there are still people that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and give their heart and their life uh, to Jesus. Now verse 30, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of of the Lord, which we were speaking about. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there is deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. So we know God will be working. We know that many, 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 many people re will reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. But there are still those, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the preaching of the 144, that will be saved. Now look at Daniel chapter 3. Daniel 3. Daniel 3. Well, I'm having trouble. There we go. Daniel 3, verse 13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancients of day, and, brought, and they brought him near before him. To him was given the dominion and glory and a kingdom, and all the na peoples and nation and languages should serve him. And the ancients of days is God himself. His dominion is everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Oh, folks, there's coming a day when God will take over this earth. Judgment will fall first. There will be a great, uh, you know, the, the, the plagues. And it just reminds me, the seven uh, bold judgments remind me of the plagues that were seen, uh, you know, before Pharaoh and in Egypt. There's some similarities not word for word, but there's some similarities there. Now look at Revelation chapter 16. Revelation 16. Look at verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of wrath of God on the earth. And then he lists the first bowl, the, the first bowl and down through here. And again, we're not going to, we'll, we'll study these specifically in about, you know, in January. But I want you to see what is happening. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul, loathsome sore, loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worship his image. All right, these are, these are the bold judgments. 
Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as dead men, and every living creature in the sea died. Boils and blood and death. Third, the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is, who was, and who is to be. That's the third time in Revelation we have heard this. And folks, it talks about eternity. It talks about who God is, who Jesus is. He is Jehovah God Almighty, all right? Who was. Folks, I am telling you, he was not created. God always was. Jesus always was and who is to be. And I'm just telling you, folks, the best for Christianity, the best for Christians is yet to come. He will come back to earth. He will destroy evil. He will destroy uh, Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet. And you can, you can be sure that that is going to happen. He will be judged because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets. And we remember back, uh, you know, in early Revelation to where the martyrs were under the altar and they were praying, Lord, even come now. Lord, even, even give us vengeance on our lives. And folks, I am telling you, that is exactly what is going to happen. God hears our prayers and God answers our prayers. And you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Folks, God does not make a mistake. God knows every name written in the Lamb's book of life. God would never be unfair. Man is unfair. Man is biased. Man is judgmental, but it'll be clear cut. Either you are saved or you're not. Either you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior or you don't. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these things and the plagues, and they did not repent, and give glory to God. And I've thought about this a lot in our study. Seeing the rapture of the church, seeing all that even precedes where we are in Revelation, how would not man figure out there is something big going on here on earth? There's something uh, strong. There's something a greater power than they've ever seen. When you see these judgments, okay? The trumpet judgments, the seal judgments, and the bowl judgments. I mean, you look at all those. That is God trying to get the attention of mankind. But there's still people that will not acknowledge God for who he is. And these judgments are coming to these lost people. And they blaspheme the name of God, verse 9, who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Oh, folks, it just breaks my heart when people blaspheme God. When they say there is no God, folks, they're going to meet him personally. They're going to stand before God. And And I tell you what's missing in our world today, a reverential fear of God. They take God's name in vain. That just chaps my hide. I'm just telling you, I can't stand to hear somebody connect God's name with a curse word. Because he is holy. He is righteous. He is pure. He is the righteous judge. And we need to understand these things are, all these judgments are trying to get uh, the, the attention of people, but they still blaspheme him and they did not repent. And do you know why they don't want to repent? 
because of sin. They would rather live in sin than live in righteousness. And folks, I am telling you, you can take or Matthew chapter 25, there will be a, a, a division of the sheep and the goats. One day, everyone will stand before God and give an account of their life to God. Now look at verse 10. And then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness. They gnawed their tongues because of pain. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because their pains and their sores and did not repeat, repent of their deeds. So we see the grain harvest is the seven bold judgments. And that was, the, that was five of them. And we'll cover the other ones uh, just here in a few minutes. So we see, we see the grain harvest. And then now let's see the grape harvest. Verse 17. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also having a sharp sickle. This was the fifth angel. And it says, and another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sickle, saying, thrust your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. See, the first group, the grain, was over, overripe. The second one, it is time. It is fully ripe according to Scripture. And when we see the altar, all right, the first thing we think of is the brazen altar of sacrifice. That we're, that's where the blood was shed, and that animal's blood paid for our sins and rolled back our sins for one year in the Old Testament. And they would take uh, the coals from the brazen altar and put it on the altar of incense. And the altar of incense were those prayers that went up for others. And those prayers of the martyrs, okay, that we had talked before. And this is what he is talking about here. Folks, I am telling you, God is going to answer their prayers. God hears every one of our prayers. God knows everything about you. We need to pray in the Spirit. We need to pray for the lost. We need to pray for Christians. We need to pray for Israel, folks. And it says, And he cried to him who had a sharp sickle, Thrust your sickle and gather the clusters of the vine on the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And folks, the difference between the grain uh, reaping and the grape is... You know, the reason for smashing the grapes is to get the juice out of the grapes, and it is used for consumption. Now, again, there's a difference between grape juice and fermented grapes, all right? I don't have time to go into that, all right? But, you know, and here's the deal about that, folks. You've got to buy it somewhere, all right? In alcohol, it's, it, it's just... Folks, I have seen the damage that it does to people and to families. And I'm just, I have just chosen to abstain. I've chosen, and here's my theory on all of life. When in doubt, do without. If I'm not sure it's right or wrong, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to taint my testimony. All right? And you can call me old-fashioned. You can call me whatever you want. But I am telling you, I believe the Bible, there are just too many things. And, and we'll, we'll share that at a, another time. But the grapes, and we know what happened, folks. Uh, we have a grape festival right down here in Altus. And you notice the TV people get up there and they pull their pants up and they're stomping on the grapes, all right? All right, that's, that's old now. They do it a totally different way. But the point in that is these grapes are smashed, okay? They, they squeeze every bit of juice out of them. Let me give you another word. They're crushed, okay? They're totally crushed, and the liquid flows down, and they gather the liquid there. So verse 19 says, So the angel thrust his sickle 
onto the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it in the great winepress of the wrath of God. Folks, I am telling you, here, these graves symbolize, symbolize lost man, okay? These are the people that were shaking their fists in the face of God. These are the people that are blaspheming God. These are the people that are unbelievers, all right? And, and they don't believe in God. They don't believe in the Bible. They certainly don't believe in Jesus Christ. And God is going to come back. And, and Satan, I'm telling you, uh, you know, with, with you know, folks uh, taking the mark of the beast, with the worship of the Antichrist and all that is going on there, folks, there will be many people that are fooled. There are many people that think, you know, if I take that mark, it's going to help me. It's going gonna, it's gonna to do me good. And folks, it will do the exact opposite. Because we have said already, if you take the mark of the beast, your soul will be damned to hell according to the word of God. In verse 20, and the winepress was trampled outside the city, and the blood came out of the winepress up to horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs, furlongs. And it says, outside the city, you know where the Battle of Armageddon is going to be done? 60 miles north of Jerusalem. Okay? That's where, you know, that, that blood... All right, it's not going to be flowing into Jerusalem. There will be a 200-mile uh, spot there. And we are talking about 10, ten uh, kingdoms. We're talking about some of the largest armies. And folks, I, I don't have to name, uh, you know, you, you should know. You can see them. You can see these. You can see the, the China army. You can see the Russian army. You can see all these that have literally tons and tons of soldiers, all right? And that's where the battle of not the century, the battle of all battles will be fought. Hold your finger there and go to Revelation 16 with me again. Revelation 16, and this is the sixth bowl, the sixth bowl. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river uh, Euphrates, and it's it is water was dried up so that the way of the kings, the east, might be prepared. And, and of course, the Euphrates uh, flows 1,800 miles long. Uh, the Garden of Eden was, was near the Euphrates River. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, coming out, out of the mouth of dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of, of false prophets. For they are spirits of demon, demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to, to battle at that great day of God Almighty. And he is speaking of the battle of Armageddon. All these folks are going to line up against uh, Israel and God. And it says in verse 15, Behold, I am coming as a thief, blessed as he who watches this is Jesus' words, and keep his garments, lest they walk naked and see his shame. And again, it gives us the warning uh, that we're not going to know. Folks, nobody knows the day or the hour. And then it t tells you basically to be ready. And it's speaking, I believe it's speaking as a soldier would, okay? And what is a soldier? When they're on active duty and they are guarding things. All right, they keep soldiers around the clock guarding things. And folks, that's what he is talking about. He's saying, we as Christians, man, we need to be clothed in righteousness. We need to be clothed, you know, in, in all the things uh, that Jesus is. And we need to be ready, not just ready for the rapture of the church, but ready to share with others. Now, verse 16, and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. So we know that will be the battles of all battles, which is the great harvest. Now look at Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 11. 
Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on, on, him, on him was called Faithful and True. In righteousness he judges and makes war. Folks, I am telling you, this is Jesus Christ on that white horse. This is the second coming. See, the rapture had already occurred. The seven years of the tribulation had happened. At the end of those seven years, these bold judgments, and then the battle of Armageddon. And his eyes were the flame of fire on his head, were many crowns. What does that mean? He will take over. He will defeat all the kings, all ten of them, all the kings that go against him, they, they, he will defeat. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And by the way, if nobody knows, don't, don't even try to guess. He's not going to give it to you. All right? When it says nobody knows, that's what the Bible means. He was clothed with, with a robe dipped in blood. His name is the Word of God. Oh, folks, the Word of God is our Bible. The Word of God is true. The Word of God is what we stand for and stand on. It is yes, it is amen. I believe it from Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on the white horse. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. Folks, we are not going to do battle. Jesus is going to wipe them out by himself. And who will be coming from heaven? Who will be uh, with, with Jesus during this time? Number one, the church. Number two, tribulation believers. Number three, Old Testament saints. And number four, holy angels. All of them will come back with Jesus Christ. Now out of his mouth, and he himself will rule them with the rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierce and the wrath of Almighty God. He has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, folks, Jesus is that victor. Jesus will come back, and he will wipe them out. He will wipe them out. And we don't have time uh, to read the rest of those, but basically what he does at the end of that, right before the millennium, he takes the, uh, the Satan, the Antichrist, uh, and the false prophets and all the demons, and he throws them into the abyss to be locked up for 1,000 years. So, in closing, Psalm 24. And by the way, what they were talking about back, back in our text, that blood, it will be such a bloody war that the blood and the slaughter will go up to the bridles of horses. 200 mile radius. And it's saying that is going to be the slaughter. And folks, that's, that's three to four feet high and maybe even five, depending on how tall the horse is. But it is, it, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. But but folks, that's what the Bible says, and we will believe it. So Psalm 24, and I close with this. Psalm 24. The Bible says, The earth is the Lord in all its fullness, the wor world and those who dwell in it. For he is founded upon the seas and established it upon the water. Folks, everything that you see is God. It's all God. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your faith. Folks, I am telling you, because you are saved, because you are one of the chosen ones. I am telling you, the divine protection of God is in your life. Look at verse 7. And lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. 
Who is this King of glory? The Lord, the strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? And the Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Folks, I believe with all my heart, Jesus is coming back soon. The rapture of the church is coming. All this uh, study and prophecy is going to be true. Yes and amen. You know, Jesus came the first time as a servant. He will return as a sovereign king. In his first coming, he came in humility. In his second coming, he will come with majesty and splendor. Jesus came the first time to seek and to save those who are lost. When he returns, he will judge the living and the dead. Jesus came the first time as a sower. He will come again as the reaper. Folks, Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for your written word. God, thank you for the truth of Scripture. And God, my prayer today is that we will all be ready. God, I pray if there's one here today that doesn't know you, today would be their day of salvation. God, I pray if they're doubting, if they're not sure, that they would make sure. God, this is too serious. It is forever and ever. Eternity is forever. So God, I pray that your spirit would just speak to heart. And God, I pray for the Christian. God, the best thing we could do is live like Jesus. I know we're not perfect, but God, I pray that we would live for him. God, I thank you for his example that he has left for us. I thank you for the word of God. And God, I thank you for, for those who are Christian examples. And Lord, just to take it a step further, not just being a Christian, it's sharing the gospel with others. And God, there may be some who need to follow you in baptism today or even join our church. God, you, they, they know if you've come much at all, you know what we stand for. We love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. And God, we want to serve you 100% in, all of you. So God, if I pray, I pray that if you move on someone today to join our church, that they would answer that call. God, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this Thanksgiving season. And God, I just pray that you would be with us, especially during this time of invitation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?